Welcome back to the podcast that promotes highness. But based on education and experiential knowledge, the only way I can truly stay high the rest of my life is by being clean and sober. Today, we're going to talk to Wesley Gear, who was a founder of Head P, also known as Planet Earth, toured for a few years as the lead guitarist for Korn, and then founded Rock to Recovery, where they have an amazing group of professional musicians who go to treatment programs and write songs and play music with their clients. They teach those that may be struggling the therapeutic power behind music and their highness that they found while clean. Now I'm gonna see you in a few minutes and I wanna show you Wes My name is Eric McCoy, and I'm high, but I'm doing it clean. Hey, I'm honored, and I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to not only introduce my guest to those who may not know him, but to also utilize his knowledge and experience to help us break apart the stigma that keeps that dark cloud that's hovering over many of us. You know, despite many people's view of those dependent on drugs, who they believe are useless, talentless, or stupid, I'm going to beg to differ. Wesley Gear, or also known as Wes Style, too many is far from that stigma. And before I introduce him, I want to make clear to those that are listening that being famous, wealthy, and or set on a pedestal by others has nothing to do with this. When I was first communicating with Wes, I introduced this podcast as our podcast, and it's a platform that I've designed for anybody who has a story that they want to tell that can help someone. And you know what? Anybody who strives to help is famous in my eyes. I will look up to you, and your knowledge is wealthy. Now, I've never met my guest before today, but I do know his work, and i I've seen the miracles that come from his unique form of therapy. Wesley Gear has had a prof been a professional musician for over 20 years. He was a founding member of Head P, or Planet Earth, as a guitarist, songwriter, and a producer. After eight years, he left the band for personal reasons, which brought him what I believe to be one step forward and maybe to fulfill his purpose in life. In 2010, he joined Korn as their touring guitarist for several years. He is an intelligent man, which knocks out that stigma of stupid and has a talent that he has turned into one of the greatest therapeutic tools. And yes, we're talking about music. Rock to Recovery was founded on, and I love this date, 12-12-12, by Wesley Gear and was created for veterans, youth, and those working to overcome addiction as well as other various mental health issues. Rock to Recovery helps people heal and transform their lives through the powerful experience of writing, playing, and performing music as a group. Wes, your passion to help people makes you famous in my eyes. I look up to you as a teacher because your knowledge brings a wealth that is priceless. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today on our podcast. 
I had an opportunity to attend the 2016 show in Los Angeles where some of us were lucky enough to see Chester Bennington for the last time or for the first time. I went to that show with Bob Forrest and Julian Ness, who was supposed to give the award to his father, Mike Ness. But I think, and what I heard, like many quarrels, it gave you the opportunity. Now, I have a pretty clear understanding of the life as a musician because of many friends of mine that live that life and some who currently live that life. But for our listeners, I can make assumptions on what happened. But again, before I ask, ask this question again, I want to thank you, Wes, really, for coming and doing this today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for what you do. You know, I... <clears throat> So in 2003, you left Head P, I guess, Planet Earth, right? P.E. Head P.E., yeah. Head P.E., okay. And yeah. I wanted to ask you what pushed you over the edge and caused you to leave that band. Well, the main catalyst was internal drama we had. Um, it was, you know, they say romance and finance is always what it is. Uh, you know, the singer and I, it's a, it sounds so oversimplified when i say it was about it was about a girl but it was a lot bigger than that it was uh you know we got we got a record this record deal with head pe we didn't get like we're together for years and when we were getting that record deal the singer and i were on massive amounts of drugs i was on doing meth all the time um i think most of us in this band really just thought you know that typical uh stereotype of like yeah you get wasted and play music and go on tour. And certainly I carried that flag. Um, a lot, a lot of guys in the band did. And, you know, let's t talk about bands in general. You take their, your kids, you don't know anything. And all of a sudden you're given a bunch of money, you go play and you're signing autographs and you maybe don't even have life skills. Like we couldn't even pay our rent on time. We couldn't even take out the trash. It was Jared, the singer and chad and i lived in this nice house we rented together in huntington beach you know million dollar house i mean now it is back then it wasn't but but uh we weren't rich by any means we were actually broke but the point is we weren't even smart enough to pay the bills on time and handle our stuff so you know we're kids we got we got you know a little bit of money come in we're partying we're doing a lot of drugs you bring in some drama and uh i just think we are ill-equipped to process it as hard as we tried um, it's tough to work through challenges where people are hurt and egos are hurt and trust is violated. Meanwhile, that whole time I knew the internal dialogue I had was I'm killing myself with this lifestyle. And so when the lifestyle became miserable in the last year or so of touring and that last record we did was not fun anymore. It was miserable because the brotherhood had died in the band so the camaraderie we would have to, that would get you through those long days touring was gone. And it was a source of pain. Now it's just like, I, I just ran, I ran, you know, and uh, towards the end of it, I was trying to control my using, trying to, you know, control it to some form or fashion. And uh, I was started praying before every show, like just go. I, and I'm, I'm not a religious guy. I'm not, I just, but just desperate, like foxhole prayers, they call it, right? Guy's not religious at all. He's out there maybe fighting a battle, a bomb comes and he goes, oh God, please no. You know, like, so that's what it was. It wasn't that I was religious or even spiritual, but it was like, God help me. What do I do? This is unending. It's brutal. And, uh, and then next thing you know, I, I bailed on the band. By the way, how is my hair? I need a haircut so bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now you joined Corn. I guess you took uh, Brian Welsh is yeah, position yep. in 2010, and and you were clean and sober at that time, right? I got that gig entirely because I was sober. So the fun, and I'll try to do it succinctly. The fun part of that story is I left my band uh, head and was out of music, and then I had to go get sober because I got really bad. I went back into drugs, and you know, when we go to get sober, our brain tells us what sober life is going to be like, or maybe before we get sober, Oh, if I get sober, it's going to suck or whatever. My brain said, I'll never play music again. And after getting sober for a few years, I was like, man, I really want to play again. I felt like this burning in my soul, like it was supposed to happen. Not an ego. Like I got to be famous. It's like, I feel like I'm supposed to be playing. 
I got into prayer meditation, like just show me the way universe, show me, I want to get back into music. And then within 10 days, monkey from corn hit me up. Hey, you want to come play, play guitar with us? We heard you're sober now. Cause I had a horrible reputation before that. And the guy they had on tour at the time was actually Shane Gibson who drank himself to death. So they were like, we, but they didn't know he was going to do that. Obviously they're like, this guy's kind of out of control. And would you like to come play for us? We know you're sober. And so I got that gig because I was sober. So was the rest of the band clean or? Uh, they, they kind of cleaned up in their own way, you know, uh, you know, like, yeah, yeah. In their own way. I, I wouldn't say all of them are absolutely sober, but definitely they had the partying in a, it down to the partying down to an in control version for each of themselves individually. You know, it wasn't like the old days of, you know, corn in the nineties, which we toured had toured with corn and orgy in the nineties. Then it was a completely different when I got with them uh, in 2010. So out of all the years that I've worked in the industry, I've been in the industry coming up on 20 years and obviously went through a lot of it myself and kind of what you had said with, you know, so many people think that once I get clean and sober, life's going to suck. Life's going to be boring. And what, you know, what's the point in a lot of ways. And yeah, this is, this is one of the main reasons why I call this podcast high wall clean because it doesn't have to be that way. You know, and I learned in my recovery that, you know, again, highness is not a property of drugs. It's a property of people. And highness comes from within. I can get high every day. You and I, I feel like we're getting high right now. Yeah. You know? It's hard for, it's hard for, well, first of all, let's go back to what you're saying. We think our life's over when we get sober. So if somebody's considering getting sober, it's very likely that it's not working and it ain't that fun or else why wouldn't quit if it's friggin' awesome and life's amazing and I get high and I do drugs or whatever and I drink and I drink wine and it's amazing, then you're not going to want to quit. So if you're looking at quitting, then there's a problem. Then it's just really how big the problem is. So for people I know, they call it the great jumping off point. I can't imagine my life going on like this, getting loaded the way I am, but I can't imagine sober life. Well, for me, how insane is it that I'm like doing meth, doing heroin? I've lost my band. Nobody trusts the word I say because I'm so full of it. I have no dignity, no pride, no direction in life. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Sober. That sounds like it's going to be pretty lame. It's like, dude, how lame is your life now? Yeah. If you're even considering sobriety, it's probably pretty lame. And that's why we talk about in recovery. If you're not sure you have a problem, if you're not sure sobriety is for you, then go try it. Go con try to control it the best you can. And, and if you can create a good life for yourself, great. But if you can't and it keeps sucking, it's just uh, data and history shows it's just going to keep getting worse. So if it keeps getting worse and you finally come to the realization you can't get sober on your own or you need some help, that's why I'm here. You're here. We're all here saying, hey, you don't got to do this alone. Yeah. Why do it alone? And then the universe will show you God, whatever you want to call it, serendipity. <laughs> what, what I asked is I was like, okay, man, if there's something there, show me like the evidence I'm supposed to be on this path. And then you start realizing, oh, one of my old buddies is sober. Another buddy's sober. Wow. Look at all these rock stars are sober. You were sober the whole time. Yeah, bro. I just never told you I was sober. You never asked. All those years we toured together, you weren't sober. Oh, I mean, you were sober. So it's like you start realizing that you have this whole support ready for you to plug into. The same way when you need a drinking buddy, you can usually find one. Or if you, you know, hey, man, you want to do some blow? Those people appear. Well, the people that appear for you too when you're trying to find a path of recovery and change your life. Yeah. You know, you're, you're an example of one of the premises of my book, you know, pain, failure, and misery are the stepping stones to success. And, you know, I've been talking to Clinton, um, who I was trying to get on my podcast and he kind of keeps blowing me off for whatever reason. <laughs> I heard now he he's is. been a pretty busy guy producing DI records all by himself. I mean, I don't want to like make excuses for him, but, but I'm in a band with him and I've yeah. been having a hard time nailing him down myself. So, yeah. But yeah, the, you know, drugs and alcohol are everywhere. And 
I think it's so important for people to understand that, you know, it's really about learning to live in a world where it's at, but we don't have to do it ourselves. And musicians, um, you know, are the greatest examples of that. You know, if you're able to stay clean and sober in that world, in that environment where drugs are everywhere, you know, whether they be within the band that you're with or out in your entire crowd that you're playing to, that you're able to, you know, live in that world where it is, but you don't have to do it yourself. And part of that comes down to that. And I try to teach people this, that it's not about hiding from the world. You know, we re- hopefully we eventually reach that place where we're not hiding anymore. You know, one of my favorite bands uh, was the Grateful Dead. And in 91, 92, I ran off with the Grateful Dead, did a lot of the West Coast tours, traveling around, lots of LSD, you know, lots of drugs. And I had an opportunity in 2015 to go up to Santa Clara to see the reunion show. Luckily, I was able to get tickets were very difficult to get. And drugs were everywhere. But I realized that I can still do these things. I can still be clean and sober. And honestly, I love it that much more. Yep. And, you know, now I can actually remember it. <laughs> I can remember what I did. And uh, so, yeah, that's amazing. And so now you guys do, um, you guys have a band called Sacred Sons. that. Yeah, Sacred Sons is our kind of like, uh the b-list all-star band uh when we do the rock recovery event so you know we wanted to create a really cool sober event and so rock recovery is an event where we honor sober rock stars we honored honored you were talking about earlier mike ness from social distortion uh moby uh uh let me see who else did we do uh cory taylor we had Katie Seagal too, who's the Peg Bundy on Married with Children, and also I forget her character name in um, Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy, but she is she came. Actually, people don't know this. She came to L.A. to be a singer, but then, oh darn, fell into some giant acting roles. But her band is incredible. Anyhow, um, and her story is the same. You know, my career took off, and my greatest life uh, happened after getting sober. And same with Mike Ness, you know, here's a guy, punk rock as anybody could be. And he's like, yeah, I would do the worst Mike Ness in person. I was like, there would have never been a social distortion if I didn't stop, if I didn't stop shooting dope, you know? And, uh, <laughs> sorry, Mike. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so it's just incredible. So yeah, the sacred sons is like us other sober band guys to get together and play covers. So we have like Clinton from DI and Monty Pittman who plays his, his, he's a metal guy, but he actually plays with Madonna. And we had Shavo from System of a Down play with us. And Zach, who uh, is the music director for Jay-Z and also uh, played keyboard with Korn for a long time and Everlast. So it's a bunch of us uh, that get together and do covers and stuff uh, for the Rock to Recovery events. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, so, you know, Elton John had a, had a great quote. And he said, music has healing power. It has the ability to take people out of themselves for a few hours. Yeah. And I think about that with you guys and and what you guys do, you know, about like learning to live in the moment right here and right now. And when you're sitting there and writing music and then performing music, do you think that assists in that ability? Well, you're asking a direct question about Rock to Recovery. So what Rock to Recovery is we have the event which is a sober event, sells out 1,300 people, Stone Temple Pilots guys, Billy Idol, you know, also Velvet Revolver, all sorts of people have played there. Okay, that funds our nonprofit. But what Rock to Recovery does as its core model is we take music into treatment centers. Um, it's a twist. You know, traditional music therapy usually is listening to a song or talking about lyrics and how they make you feel. Uh, there is sometimes composition and music creation or drum circles, but it's usually the latter and less the former in my experience. Um, and so what I wanted to do with Rock Recovery, because I went to a rehab and we were doing crayon pictures and yoga and all these things. I was like, 
where's music in all this? So when the corn gig was going away, I was like, oh no, what do I do now? I'm losing this rock star gig. I don't even know how I'm going to make a living. And I wanted to get, you know, my brain, it's easy to si slip into self-pity. Now here you are again, out of a career. What are you going to do now? You're sober, you're a musician, you know, is life going to suck? And I was like, well, I don't think the universe put me here to have a sucky life. And I prayed and said, if this is who I am, how do I help people and make a living? And that was a big difference because in the old days, I never asked, how can I help people? And I was taught that. And so this idea to bring music into treatment centers as a healing force. Now, I wasn't a music therapist. I'm not a music therapist. I didn't do a bunch of studies. I just knew in a gut way that it was powerful. But what I watched happen is when we go in there and we write songs with the clients. So you might have 10 dudes in a male uh, rehab, old guy, young guy, junkie, wino, whatever. And we connect on a level that we can relate to and we write lyrics about our feelings, our emotions, our struggles, which is what music's about. It's a, it's a story put to music. And then we get them playing. And I watched a heroin junkie, and I don't know, you know, anybody out there knows, and some probably don't. When you're detoxing from heroin, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you're defecating yourself. It's like COVID times a million. Um, this guy came in and he was really mad. Like, why is this music group here? I'm a junkie. I'm going to die. What the heck? I can't sleep. I can't eat, blah, blah, blah. And I gave him a little shaker. That's why I call this, I call him Mr. Pink. It was a little pink shaker, looked like an egg. And I showed him the song we're working on and where the groove was. And, and by the end, he was jumping around ecstatic and he was like, dude, you going to be here next week. And so that may sound subtle, but what I witnessed is it changed his physical pain. It took away how his his sickness was physically. He he was he had hope because he was suicidal before that. He was happy. He was elated. So the measures of wellness is what they call it in the therapeutic world were insane. And so there was a total transformation that happened with this guy and so many of the people we work with. And so the thing is, is like when we listen to music, if you ask people, like, hey. Music's powerful. It changes the way you feel, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's half the brain. When we listen to music, it lights up half the brain. But in Rock Recovery, we get everybody singing and playing together. So we have this connective ex exercise. So we're sharing the music that makes it exponentially greater. Plus, we're playing it so it engages the whole brain. And it literally stimulates serotonin, dopamine, endorphins. And then when you get singing and connecting to people, it releases oxytocin. And oxytocin, by, to science, it's called the love molecule. Oxytocin is released when we hug people or after you make love or have a baby or whatever. It's, it's, it's the thing we release when we feel loved and connected. And the opposite of addiction is connection. I didn't make that up. And, and I totally believe that. And so, yeah, you know, these therapists, you can imagine in a rehab, you got a bunch of people who are hurt and full of shame, like screw the world, my life sucks. And then you're trying to get them to talk about their past and they're like, eh, whatever. But the therapist would walk by and we'd have dudes up there rapping and dancing and singing and playing. And they're like, what are you doing to these people? What drug does that? We had a girl come in who are, she just heard her friend OD'd as she came in a group and she was crying her brains out. And she's like, I can't do this today. I'm like, well, this is actually what this is here for. So we wrote a song about losing people to drugs and ODs. And by the end, I'm not going to say that she was like, you know, you know, rainbows and bunnies shooting out her head, but she had a transformation there. You know, she was smiling, the tears chilled out. She felt like just a transformation happened. And what drug could take somebody who's crying so hard over losing their best friend who died to feeling loved and connected and part of and elated in some form. It's, it's super powerful. And, 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 and it's totally underutilized. Mm -hmm. I think if aliens or God or whatever other beings are out there, they're like, you guys are blowing it down there. We give you music. You're not even, you know what I mean? So you guys were getting high. <laughs> high. That's it's a hat. It's absolutely high. Absolutely. So I want to tell you a quick story, and this is this is interesting. So I had um, I was running a place down in the Temecula area, and I had set up 
a room in this place. It was a 10,000 square foot house. And in one side of the house, we had this gigantic room. And so I'd set it up as a music room. I had drum sets and, you know, amps and speakers and guitars and, you know, everything for that. And, and myself and a friend of mine probably utilized the room the most. And we found it to be a great stress relief at the end of the day and of course we did a lot of grateful dead songs <laughs> and yeah, I'd sing, he'd play the guitar and excuse me so we were playing one day and we had a client there who was very quiet he was shy he was um, ne never really shared much about himself and even during the assessment that um, he had done with his therapist and counselor he shared very little about his real pain in life and we had always you know tried to ask him questions and we knew something really deep was in there that he was holding back and he didn't want to talk about. And sure. so he came to me one day and he said, Hey, if I write a poem or I write lyrics, will you guys perform it? Mm. And I said, absolutely. I said, be great if you were a part of it. But again, he was very shy. He was very um, sort of withdrawn and he really didn't want to do that. And so, so he, um, after about two weeks, he brought me and it was really kind of written as a poem. And I wanted to read this real quick. I still have this. Um, and this is what he wrote. And this was so interesting because it answered a lot of our questions. Um, Jimi Hendrix, he, he said, always said, music doesn't lie. And this is what, what his lyrics were. Dear God, take care of my little girl with her big eyes and her soft brown curls. Rachel was special, as you should know. Really don't want to let her go. And this thing kind of went on. And, and so, you know, and he wrote, it was, it was semi-long. And so me and Jonathan, you know, and I remember reading this and I was like, oh my God, this, this is powerful. And we didn't even know anything really about this. I mean, and Jonathan and I were kind of making assumptions on really what this was about. And, it, you know, and it kind of explained more as it, as it went on. So Jonathan and I, we, you know, worked on some music and worked to put something together and we brought him in one day and I had his therapist come in. And so we performed this to him and I sang it and, mm -hmm. and, and um, after we were done, he was in tears as we were doing this. And his therapist asked, hey, what if you did this for the entire group and asked the client if that was okay? And he said, yes. And mm -hmm. so we brought all the clients in and, and Jonathan and I performed this. And one of the most amazing things happened as a result of this, and I'm sure you have, you have seen this, um, was that all of a sudden he started opening up and he started talking. Mm -hmm. He became more a part of what was ultimately going on. And the story behind it was his 10 year old daughter was hit and killed by a car right in front of him. And as a result of this, the story had kind of gone on about then his wife ended up leaving him. He lost his job. He lost his house. He lost everything. Mm. And that was powerful, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that again, the power behind music, and I'm sure you have seen stories or experienced various different things. What's the most powerful and, and thing have you have you seen throughout this that you could think of? Yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, we've written over 18, probably closer to 20,000 songs. So it's 20,000 sessions. So if you can imagine 20,000 times the eight or 10 people we have in there and all these little subplots happening. But I... um. I remember, um, I mean, you know, they say, they say some real life stories are so insane that if you put them in a movie, they would not, they'd be like too cheesy. You'd be like, whatever. But I mean, I've seen those stories. Like we work with wounded warriors of the air force, AFW two, as they're known. And this gal came in and we always talk and figure out where we're going to go lyrically. And she's in a wheelchair and she's like, I've had a hundred and something surgeries. You know, she names, you know, 32 on this and 40 here and 60. They're trying to fix her because she's, you know, demolished in combat. 
And she's like, you know what? I'm going to sing. And then as we sang the song, she got up out of her wheelchair, like grabbing the mic, holding it up and just started belting. And she goes, I haven't stood up out of my wheelchair. And like, so <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, you put that in a movie, people are going to be like, oh yeah, she gets up. But it's like, it happened. Like, and it was the power of music and the connection where she's like, you know what? I'm going to stand here and I'm going to sing this song, you know, even with weak legs. And there's just so many stories of, of uh, transformations. That's what they are. People find in hope, people find in courage, you know? Now I want to pause real quick for a commercial break. Don't forget to watch the High Wall Clean show at youtube.com slash High Wall Clean. Please help support this not-for-profit show by helping us help other people find the show. All you got to do is help by listening, watching, rating, subscribing, and sharing. But most of all, we hope you enjoy this episode experience the understanding of highness and see that being clean and sober can be fun and far from boring. Yeah. So you're working, uh, you said with the air force, uh, with PTSD kind of stuff. And yeah, well, you know, they have, uh, I think it's well publicized that, uh, that, you know, a couple dozen veterans kill themselves every day the number is probably higher than that it's probably underreported and uh uh the air force actually has the highest rate and they started doing a program um to support um you know wounded veterans or veterans who couldn't serve anymore or whatever and uh it's called the uh, air force wounded warrior uh it's not wounded warrior project that's a whole other nonprofit. Um, and we got a con so once Rock the Recovery was working, um, we were like, man, I wonder if we could work with veterans. And then about a year into what we were doing, we we got we, you know, it's how the universe works. They had just launched that program where they were doing like wheelchair basketball and seated volleyball and all these sports activities to bring people together. Because what happens is you go into the service and you're like, I will give my life to serve my brothers and sisters. This is what I'm doing for my life for my career. And then you get injured or something, so you can't work. So you lose your brothers and sisters. You lose your purpose in life. Plus, you have physical, mental, emotional injuries. Then you go back home to quite possibly a small town, and you're sitting there in hell with, you know, so they bring them and reintegrate in, in these, like, you know, um, sporting events and stuff. And they started adding ancillary services. And ours was one of the first they added, which was music. And we started writing songs with them. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you see these incredible stories. Uh, there was actually a girl who was like, I came to this event and figured it wasn't going to work for me. And, but I would just come to get people off my back. And then when I go home, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And she came in and she played with us in one of the sessions. And then later she goes, you know, rock recovery helped put a song back in my heart. So, and now she's out there and we're not taking credit for all of it, but we're part of the solution. Right. You know, and, uh, and now she's out there as a speaker sharing her story of transformation. So she went like, she was literally about to take her own life. And so, you know, in the world of recovery and transformation, we don't know what's going to connect with people, what's going to reach them and what's going to, you know, be that flimsy reed that they grab that helps them stop from dr drowning. But the more stuff we can do out there, there's more and more studies and data that, that this stuff actually works, you know? So we're, we're happy to be part of, part of it. When you were with uh, head PE um, and you, did you write lyrics at all with the band or? A little bit, uh, not a ton, very little bit. The first song on our first album, which is called POS, which standed for piece of shit. Uh, those lyrics, I pretty much wrote all those. Yeah. But after that, just little snippets here and there. Yeah. Cause I always, I always wonder, you know, when people with musicians, especially when they write songs, are they, how much are they directed towards themselves or their pain or their feelings or the things that are going on with their life? Well, my, I've written a lot of lyrics, um, you know, for my own stuff, just home. And, uh, when I was in my darkest, place uh after i left head pe and i'm still doing meth and heroin super depressed and lost with my life and all alone i was 
doing these songs and I never wrote lyrics down like, what's this song going to be about? I would do the music and then I would just start singing. And then when I would listen back, not really even knowing what I was singing, it would be like, please help me. I can't live like this anymore. You know, I'm, you know, it was, it was about a lot of songs written to my singer about, you know, you know, why does it have to be this way kind of vibe? You know what I mean? Like, can't we work past this kind of stuff? And I was like, wow, how totally transparent <laughs> what's going, what's coming out right now from me. And, and it was totally unintentional, you know? Yeah. That's what we find a lot in our rock recovery sessions, you know, because you know, a lot of most people are like, I can't do this. I can't write. I can't play because rock recovery is for non-musicians. It's just for average everyday people. And then we, we are skilled and talented at how to pull it out of them. So they don't know how to write lyrics. But as soon as they start writing, it's like, it's like what you said that they just like, it's like, you know, Oh, you know, my cat is dead. And you're like, okay, well, that's what we got to talk about today. It's really bumming you out. You know, the, the intro to, you know, my podcast, that song I, I had written, I don't know if you'd listened to it, but I had, I had written it. And, uh, and when I, I used to be a partner of a program down in Lake Elsinore, and so I'd originally written it and it was sort of kind of going to be for the program and about the program, what we did. And so after writing it, I went down there and we had a couple of clients and one of them was actually a professional keyboardist. And another one was a, wasn't with a band or anything, but a semi-decent drummer. And so we actually, that, that recording that I have was actually what I had done with the clients that were so at the cool. place. Yeah. And it was, yeah. it turned out really good. And we felt that way too afterwards. Like, man, I feel high. I'm mm -hmm. high. <laughs> you know? yeah. And a lot of them felt that, you know, it was probably one of the most therapeutic things that they did throughout their entire time was just to play music and experience that. And together con in a connective sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if a treatment program wants to um, have rock to recovery, uh, come out what is what is that process and how does that work so if you're we work with residential and treatment programs and outpatient treatment programs um so basically if like that's where i got the idea when i was in rehab i had a curriculum like wake up make your bed you know breakfast do chores meditation meet your therapist all day long they got you busy that's how my experience was. I'm sure there's somewhere you sit around all day, but ours was very engaged in activities that were uh, created to bring, um, bring along change and growth and learning and transformation. So that's it. If a, if a treatment center um, wants a program like ours, they just hire us and we come in, you know, every Thursday at 2 PM, we'll be there with whoever the clients are. Obviously clients come in and out as they graduate and stuff. Um, yeah. And then the, something with the Wounded Warriors, uh, the Air Force, they have events around the country. So we fly to different states and we've even gone to Hawaii and Germany to, to Rammstein to work with uh, veterans and even their children out there. Um, and those are more like once a year events that happen in a few locations. Um, and then we're, we're, we work with a few VAs and the spinal cord injury, um, I think they're in uh, – I want to say they're in Long Beach. I, I, I forgive me. I forget. Uh, but these are people who like, you know, quadriplegic and they can only use a couple of fingers and we write songs with them playing keyboard or whatever they can do. And uh, we go in there every week and it's something that people really look forward to, you know, because you guys are obviously here in Southern California. I thought I was California. We're in Oregon. Uh, we have a guy up there doing a bunch of sessions up in Oregon and we have a guy in Nashville also. And we're up and down Southern California. I got two guys in San Diego, four in Orange County, and four, I want to say, in Los Angeles County. Oh, three in L.A. Well, four in L.A. County, and then I got two guys up in, like, the Gilroy South Bay area. Yeah, so you guys are all over the place now. <laughs> yeah, once I had it working on my own, my brother, who's really smart, you know, again, I was, like, running out of money. I you know, I didn't know. And I was like, showed my brother who's successful entrepreneur. And I was like, dude, look, you know, I had a few grand in invoices. Like I'm, this thing's working. And he's like, can you scale it though? And I was like, scale it. Yeah. Can I show other people how to do this, this thing I'm doing? And then I was like, who would I even show? Wait a second. 
Sonny Mayo played in Snot, Seven Dust, Ugly Kid Joe. He's sober at that time, probably 12 years. He's produced records. And my other buddy, Nate, uh, who sang for his band, Death on Wednesday. And I started training on what I was doing. And then um, then we had another gift from the universe. Once I had them, there's this one treatment program we got as a client that just went massive. They went huge. And they are like, and then you hear this a lot um, with different entrepreneurial stories, but they're like, we want you in every location. I was like, oh my God, I got to get some more dudes. And then away we went. If you were to have a message for those that are out there suffering and, you know, and, and cause again, you know, one of my big purposes on this is to help fight the stigma, you know, obviously of substance abuse and, and in a lot of ways give voice to those that we've lost. And obviously we, you know, people are dying in record numbers um, as a result of substance abuse and, there's going to be a lot of people obviously that don't have the ability to even hear this podcast because they're just out, out and about. Um, but if you had a message to give to those that are suffering something that could be very helpful, what would that be? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first thing is you're worth it. You deserve to have an amazing life. I think so many people have self-worth issues. They feel not lovable. And, uh, I believe everybody's here uh, with the ability that they can have a wonderful, amazing life. Um, I would say that you, whoever is listening, are not your trauma. You're not all those problems and the mistakes you made. That's not who you are. You're a wonderful, magical human being. And uh, recovery is about letting go of all those things that aren't us and becoming not, it's not really even about fixing a broken person. It's about let, letting go of what, what we are not and becoming truly what we are. And when we come truly, become truly what we are, then we become the most powerful version that the world has ever seen of ourselves. And um, there's no, you know, we have this saying where it's called terminal uniqueness. Well, you don't understand. My story is different. No, it's not. It ain't. Because there's somebody who had it worse than you, who got more traumatized than you, who's found recovery, who's overcame. So using that as an excuse just isn't true. And what you find is if you're open enough to go look and go and be open enough to go, yeah, probably people had the same kind of life I've had and have overcome it. Show me those people that can help me. I believe that the universe will show up and connect you to the right people. You know, there's, there's every type of person that's found their way in the recovery. So using that I'm different is just a bullshit excuse. But usually, like we talked about in the beginning, people aren't going to be willing to get help until they realize they can't beat the game on their own. You know, most people think like, oh, I got it. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell. I'm, I got it. I got this under control. Okay. If you got it under control, then you're going to go make those changes you need to make and you're going to be fine. And, and some people do. Good. I have a relative who did that. He was doing massive amounts of crack and they just went, I'm done. Great. That's his story. I couldn't do that. But if you're out there and you're struggling and you can't seem to make a change and you're done trying it your way, all you have to do is grab somebody and ask for help. And I think the thing that so many people do is they attach so much shame to that. And again, it's that terminal uniqueness. Like, oh, I'm so ashamed. What? You're ashamed of being the fi 15 millionth cokehead? You're ashamed of being the 20 millionth heroin junkie? Everybody's out there doing it. And don't be ashamed of just being sick. It's an illness. You know what I mean? So that's really what it is. It's like, we're not, I like the saying, we're not bad people trying to get good we're sick people trying to get well and you're just an, we're just all another sick person and there's million just to use one expression uh, one uh point of reference is alcoholics anonymous for example was founded in the 30s so you got 80 plus years of people getting transformations think of all those stories of people who <laughs> yeah, there's no story that hasn't had a transformation so you can have one too. Yeah, and I like what you said that, you know, we're not our actions. We're the one that may have done the things, but that's not who we are as a person. And I love that you said that. 
Um, yeah. And I believe, I believe that, you know, yeah, when it comes to substance abuse, it's all the same, you know, it's all the same. But when it comes to, you know, the person, you are a unique, you are a beautiful individual, you know, that, that hopefully will kind of crawl out of their shit, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and find who they are and be that person and stop being ashamed of, you know, maybe things that they've done. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I've never been a truer version of myself. And when I was in head PE, we were playing with Slipknot and Deftones and Sisova Down. You know, I was a cigarette smoking, whiskey drinking, woman chasing, drunken guitar player. And I thought, this is who I am. And when I lost the band and all that, I didn't know who I was. And I'm here to tell anybody. And, you know, it doesn't matter about band guy. Maybe you're a chef or a banker or a stockbroker, mortgage broker. The point is, when you have the transformation, you become the truest version of yourself. I've never been a truer version of myself to get to play with corn and get the best gig of my life. And these are the stories you hear in recovery. When we let go of the addiction. We have the most successful life we've ever seen and get to do that totally sober. It was the biggest gift. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, that's why we're here, right? Sharing these stories that hopefully if one person hears it, they can have a little hope that, that they're good enough, that they're worth it, and they too can have a transformation. Yeah, I was when I was at that event, uh, 2016. You know, when Mike Ness got the uh, the award, I like what he said too. You know, in terms of that, if he hadn't gotten clean and sober, social distortion wouldn't have been what it was. Or exactly. Whatever, you know, and and I think that's true for everybody. You know, you know, musicians. I mean, bands don't 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 last when they're getting fucked up all the time. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I was look, I was looking up when I was looking up some videos and stuff for, you know, the intro and stuff. I, I saw plenty of videos of you fucked up. <laughs> and so, and that's not what I wanted to show, you know? So I obviously, uh, sorry. That, you know, I'm glad there wasn't social media back then. Oh my God. How embarrassing. We were so obnoxious. Oh my God. But, uh, yeah, here we are now blessed. Uh, is there uh, is there any question I haven't asked that would be important for you to to answer? Uh, so if anybody would not Rock Recovery is a nonprofit. Um, there's easy ways to support nonprofits. Obviously, we're always trying to fundraise so we can help more people have transformations. But it's Rock to T O Recovery. You can follow us on Instagram, on Facebook. Just giving us a like helps us grow. Uh, you could take our profile and share it to some friends and go, Hey, this is pretty cool. And that costs you nothing. And you can help us spread our word. Um, and then I have a new band called human, but it's really hard to spell. It's H U three with like a backwards E, but it's a three H U three M three N. And we're putting out music, uh, as we speak, we're building our fan base, uh, somewhere between like Arctic monkeys, Radiohead, and, I don't know what, uh, yeah, uh, price, uh, bo I don't know, man. We're just all over the place. Anyhow. So that always got to do the promotion on the band. Um, yeah. and maybe if you do any, uh, if you do like, you know, when you put this online or whatever, if you could tag that in there and, and at our, uh, Instagram, that's cool. Um, and that's about it, you know? Yeah. I want to say, and, and, you know, in, in high support of you guys with rock to recovery, um, you know, I've seen amazing stuff. I highly support if anybody is out there that, that has the ability to help support rock to recovery in any way. Um, I highly encourage it. I believe that you guys are a big factor in helping people save their own lives because you Thank bring you so something, you bring a uniqueness, you guys think outside the box. And that's one of the things that I'm about is thinking outside the box, figuring out Whatever it is, is going to help people. And um, so I want to definitely thank you for coming on here. I Thanks, really Eric. It. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for tuning in to High Thanks Wall for listening. <laughs> yes. And thank you all for listening.